Good evening. It's Thursday, April 15th. The defense of former Minneapolis policeman Derek Chauvin, charged with murder and manslaughter in the killing of George Floyd, rests its case after just two days of testimony and without calling the former cop to the stand to testify in his own behalf. Final arguments in the trial are set for Monday. Another controversial police shooting In Chicago, a policeman's body camera footage released today shows a 13-year-old boy appears to have dropped a handgun and begun raising his hands less than a second before a police officer shot and killed him last month. Florida's Republican-controlled legislature approves stiffer penalties against violent protesters, handing a victory to Governor Ron DeSantis, who began campaigning for the measure last year following a summer of turmoil across the country over the killings of black people by police. The Biden administration announces the expulsion of 10 Russian diplomats and sanctions against dozens of people and companies to hold the Kremlin accountable for alleged interference in last year's presidential election and the hacking of federal agencies. But the administration says it's not retaliation and says it's seeking a stable predictable relationship with Russia. Our objective here is not to escalate. Our objective here is to impose um, costs uh, for what we feel are uh, are unacceptable actions uh, by the Russian government. A White House official says the Biden administration is preparing for the possibility that a booster shot will be needed between nine to 12 months after people are initially vaccinated against COVID-19. And four Democrats introduced legislation to expand the United States Supreme Court with four more justices. We are here today because the United States Supreme Court is broken. It is out of balance uh, and it needs to be fixed. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. The defense at the murder trial of former officer Derek Chauvin in the death of George Floyd rested its case today without putting Chauvin himself on the stand. Out of earshot of the jury, Chauvin's attorney questioned his client about his decision to invoke his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. And um, have you made a decision uh, today whether you intend to testify or whether you intend to invoke your Fifth Amendment privilege? Uh, I will invoke my Fifth Amendment privilege today. The defense presented just two days of testimony to the prosecution's two weeks. The prosecution briefly today recalled a lung and critical care expert to knock down a defense witness's theory that carbon monoxide poisoning from a squad car's exhaust might have contributed to Floyd's death. Dr. Martin Tobin noted hospital tests showed Floyd's oxygen saturation level was normal, at 98%. Prosecutor Jerry Blackwell asked Tobin what that would mean about carbon monoxide levels. So if we know that there is an oxygen saturation of 98%, does that tell us anything whatsoever? Yes, about it what, about, I'm sorry, I interrupt, I apologize. Does that tell us anything whatsoever about what the carbon monoxide content could have been at a maximum? In yes, this it does. It tells us that if, if the um, hemoglobin is saturated at 98%, it tells you all there was for everything else is 2%. And so the maximum amount of carb- carbon monoxide would be 2%. Closing arguments in the trial are set for Monday. After that, the jury is likely to be sequestered while it deliberates. 
Dante Wright's family members joined with community leaders today in calling for more serious charges against the white former police officer who fatally shot him, comparing her case to the murder charge brought against a black police officer who killed a white woman in nearby Minneapolis. Former Brooklyn Center police officer Kim Potter was charged with second-degree manslaughter in Sunday's shooting of Wright, a 20-year-old black man, during a traffic stop. The former police chief in Brooklyn Center, a majority non-white suburb of Minneapolis, said Potter mistakenly fired her handgun when she meant to use her taser. Many protesters and Wright's family members have rejected that, saying either that they don't believe it or that the incident reflects bias in policing, with Wright stopped for an expired car registration and ending up dead. The Reverend Al Sharpton is among them. When you look at the fact that you're dealing with a 26-year veteran, if she didn't know in 26 years the difference in size and weight of a gun as opposed to a taser, then how was she a veteran in policing? Mm. How was she even on the force that long? Both the chief and Potter resigned on Tuesday. Potter, who was released on a $100,000 bond hours after her arrest yesterday, appeared alongside her attorney at her initial court appearance today over Zoom, saying very little. Her next court appearance was set for May 17th. Wright's family members and protesters who have confronted police all week since Wright's death say there's no excuse for the shooting. Wright's mother, Katie Wright, said at a news conference today that justice isn't even a word for her, but she said she does want accountability. Wright family attorney Ben Crump said full accountability to get equal justice is all the family wants. Crump and other advocates for Wright point to the 2017 case of Muhammad Noor. The black former Minneapolis police officer fatally shot Justine Damon, a white woman who was a dual citizen of the U.S. and Australia, in an alley behind her home after she called 911 to report what she thought was a woman being assaulted. Nor was convicted of third-degree murder, in addition to second-degree manslaughter and sentenced to 12 and a half years in prison. Potter's charge carries a maximum 10-year prison sentence. Hundreds of protesters ignored the snow and rain to head back to the streets for a fourth night last night, protesting Wright's killing. A policeman's body camera footage released today under community pressure shows a 13-year-old Chicago boy appears to have dropped a handgun and begun raising his hands less than a second before a police officer shot and killed him last month. A still frame taken from Officer Eric Stillman's jumpy nighttime body camera footage shows that Adam Toledo wasn't holding anything and had his hands at least partially up when Stillman shot him in the chest at around 3 in the morning on March 29th. Police who were responding to reports of shots fired in the area say the teen had a handgun on him before the shooting and... Patrolman Stillman's footage shows him shining a light on a handgun on the ground near Toledo after he shot him. The Civilian Office of Police Accountability, or COPA, an independent board that investigates all police-involved shootings in Chicago, posted the video material on its website. Nineteen seconds elapsed from when Patrolman Stillman exited his squad car to when he shot Toledo. His body cam footage shows him chasing Toledo on foot down an alley for several seconds and yelling, Police stop, stop right now. As the teen slows down, Stillman yells, Hands, hands, show me your hands. Toledo then turns toward the camera. Stillman yells, Drop it. And midway between repeating that command, he opens fire and Toledo falls down. While approaching the wounded teen Stillman radios for an ambulance, he can be heard imploring the boy to stay awake. And as other officers arrive, an officer says he can't feel a heartbeat and begins administering CPR. 
Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, who along with police superintendent called on COPA to release the video, urged the public to remain peaceful and reserve judgment until the Police Accountability Board can complete its investigation. Choking up at times, he decried the city's long history of police violence and misconduct, especially in black and brown communities, and said too many young people are left vulnerable to systemic failures that we simply must fix. Florida's Republican-controlled legislature approved stiffer penalties against violent protesters today, handing a major legislative victory to Governor Ron DeSantis, who began campaigning for the measure last year, following a summer of turmoil across the country over the killings of black people by police. A divided Florida Senate approved a so-called anti-riot bill as the trial of A Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, was underway for the death of George Floyd. The measure was sent to the Florida Republican governor, who said he looked forward to signing the measure into law. (coughs) During weeks of debate, the spirits of the civil rights movement and the specter of racism wafted through the hearing rooms as bill opponents invoked the names of civil rights icons, including the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., When lawmakers introduced the bill earlier this year, some supporters cast it as a response to the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol by supporters, mostly white, of former President Donald Trump. But critics debunked that narrative and instead called the legislation an assault against the Black Lives Matter movement, as well as an attempt to curtail the right to free speech and to peaceably assemble. In fact, the genesis of the measure dates back to an September 21st press conference held by the governor and in which he was joined by the Senate president and the House speaker to condemn the protests in cities across the country and what he referred to as a tax on law enforcement. The United States Senate has opened debate on legislation confronting the rise of hate crimes against Asian Americans and immigrants. It voted overwhelmingly 92 to 6 to start considering the bill. The legislation would assign a point person within the Justice Department to expedite the review of COVID-19 related hate crimes and provide support for law enforcement to respond to such incidents. The department would also work to limit discriminatory language used to describe the pandemic. Hawaii Democratic Senator Maisie Hirono, the bill's co-author, told of her own experience. She said she's no longer comfortable taking a walk with her headphones listening to audiobooks because of the attacks on Asian American and Pacific Islanders in the U.S. At a time when the AAPI community is under siege, this bill is an important signal that Congress is taking anti-Asian racism and hatred seriously. Significantly, Democrats and Republicans are working together in good faith to come to consensus to pass this bill. Final passage, however, remains uncertain. Any one senator can halt the process, and it takes 60 votes in the Senate, which is evenly split 50-50 between Republicans and Democrats, to overcome a filibuster. Six Republicans voted yesterday against proceeding to the bill, including Senators Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz, and Josh Hawley, all potential presidential hopefuls. In Northern California's city of Antioch, the mayor announced a series of steps to address that city's historical systemic racism against the Asian community. Mayor Lamar Thorpe. Uh, we're in the middle of a national awakening that has been that has spun out of anti-Asian American and Pacific Islander hate. Thorpe signed a resolution apologizing for running Antioch's Chinese residents out of town in the mid 1800s by burning down the area's Chinatown. As mayor, I want to express my deepest sympathies to the AAPI community and pray that we get through this by working together to bring an end to violence and terror. Uh, In in that spirit today, I'm announcing a series of proposals to make amends to the Bay Area's Chinese American community uh, for historic wrongs suffered at the hands of the city's uh, founding community 
with when, xeno, when xenophobia was at its highest. Uh, their actions include landmark plaques acknowledging the area that was once Antioch's Chinatown. After the attack in 1867, the city's Chinese population dramatically dwindled. The city's resolution also condemns a recent wave of anti-Asian attacks across the U.S. today, including in Antioch. Last night, uh, I received notice from our chief of police that two Asian women, ages 50 and 70, were violently attacked and robbed at Antioch's only Asian American grocery store, Country Square Market. Our police department is investigating this matter and will look into whether or not this was a possible hate crime. This is unacceptable by any measure. Mayor Thorpe says the city will also create a permanent exhibit at the Antioch Museum acknowledging the Chinese community and the racism it faced at the hands of city leaders. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. And today, April 15th, is the 72nd birthday of this radio station, KPFA in Berkeley, the 76th anniversary of the founding of the Pacifica Foundation, which also owns and operates KPFK in Los Angeles. We are proud that we have survived nearly three quarters of a century but not so proud that we can't ask you to give us a birthday gift. Yes, it's a reverse birthday. It's our birthday. But we're asking you for a present. We're asking you for your financial support so that we can soldier on and continue to bring you the news and cultural programming, the information that this radio station and these Pacifica stations bring. We're asking you to call Financial Contribution a happy birthday gift for the 72nd birthday of this radio station to 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. And free to all donors, we'll be happy to provide you with a gift. Our Honoring Our Warriors audio pack, which includes the event, A Valentine for Leonard Peltier, the Native American leader. This Valentine event from February 13th, the year 2000, in support of Leonard Peltier, Includes readings from Winona LaDuke, Humia Abu, Jamal J, Joy Harjo, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and Peter Coyote. Plus, a lecture given by the late prize-winning, esteemed international correspondent and freelance radical reporter, Lise Ehrlich, who passed away earlier this year. A lecture from 2018 the Iran agenda today and with the revival or the attempted revival of the Iran nuclear talks and the Biden administration's attempt to reconstitute that international treaty, that lecture should still be of great relevance. Plus, an inspiring conversation between Maxine Hong Kingston and Gary Gosh on bringing the practice of mindfulness into every moment of your life. That is our Honoring Our Warriors audio pack. That is for any level of birthday gift, any level of donation. Call us at 1-800-439-5732. We have other birthday gifts for you, depending on your contribution, your financial contribution to us. And you can check those out at our website at kpfa.org. So please, if you can, if you're financially able to honor and mark and commemorate the 72nd anniversary of Pacifica Foundation and KPFA Radio. We're asking you to call us at 1-800-439-5732 
or go online at kpfa.org. Once again, any level of contribution, any level of a financial birthday gift gets you the Honoring Our Warriors audio pack. Now, back to the news. The Biden administration announced today the U.S. is expelling 10 Russian diplomats and imposing sanctions against dozens of companies and other people, holding the Kremlin accountable for interference in last year's presidential election and the hacking of federal agencies. The sweeping measures are meant to punish Russia for actions that U.S. officials say cut to the core of American democracy and to deter future acts by imposing economic costs on Moscow, including by targeting its ability to borrow money. The sanctions are certain to exacerbate tensions with Russia, which promised a response, even as President Joe Biden said the administration could have taken even more punitive measures, but chose not to. Today, I have approved several steps, including the expulsion of several Russian officials as a consequence of their actions. I've also signed an executive order authorizing new measures, including sanctions to address specific harmful actions that Russia has taken against U.S. interests. I was clear with President Putin that we could have gone further, but I chose not to do so. To be, I chose to be proportionate. The United States is not looking to kick off a cycle of, ex- of escalation and conflict with Russia. We want a stable, predictable relationship. If Russia continues to interfere with our democracy, I'm prepared to take further actions to respond. It is my responsibility as President of the United States to do so. But throughout our long history of competition, our two countries have been able to find ways to manage tensions and to keep them from escalating out of control. These sanctions against six Russian companies that support the country's cyber efforts represent the first retaliatory measures against the Kremlin for the hack familiarly known as the Solar Winds breach, with the U.S. explicitly linking the intrusion to the SVR, a Russian intelligence agency. Biden said he advised Russian President Putin in a telephone conversation days earlier of the forthcoming measures. And he called for more cooperation with Russia, including a summit meeting with Putin this summer. In the earliest days of my administration, we were able to move quickly to extend for five years the New START Treaty and maintain that key element of nuclear stability between our nations. And that was in the interest of the United States, of Russia, and quite frankly, of the world. And we got it done. When I spoke to President Putin, I expressed my belief that communication between the two of us personally and directly was to be essential in moving forward to a more effective relationship, and he agreed on that point. To that end, I propose that we meet in person this summer in Europe for a summit to address a range of issues facing both of our countries. Our teams are discussing that possibility right now. The White House did not impose sanctions related to separate reports that Russia encouraged the Taliban to attack U.S. and allied troops in Afghanistan, saying instead that Biden was using diplomatic, military, and intelligence channels to respond. Reports of alleged bounties surfaced last year, with the Trump administration coming under fire for not raising the issue directly with Russia. Administration officials said today they had only low to moderate confidence in that intelligence, in part because of the ways in which the information was obtained. China described its military exercises near Taiwan as combat drills, upping the ante as senior former U.S. officials arrived in Taiwan on a trip to signal President Biden's commitment to the nation and its democracy. Taiwan has complained over the proximity of repeated Chinese military activity, including fighter jets and bombers entering its air defense zone and a Chinese aircraft carrier exercising off the island, which is claimed by Beijing. The U.S. delegation was due to meet with Taiwan's president today in a visit that is further straining Sino-U.S. relations. Patrick Falk reports from Beijing. 
It's cast as a high-level, unofficial visit, but the delegation includes former U.S. Senator Chris Dodd and former Secretaries of State Richard Armitage and James Steinberg, and come as tensions have escalated with China in the Taiwanese Strait. On Thursday, President Tsai Ing-wen warned China's incursions into Taiwan's airspace and military drills in waters nearby threatened peace and stability. China accuses Taiwan of colluding with Washington to promote independence. Beijing considers the island part of China's sovereign territory. The U.S. is banned by treaty to protect Taiwan in the event of an attack and stepped up its relationship with the territory. Patrick Falk, Beijing. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken made an unannounced visit to Afghanistan today to sell Afghan leaders and a wary public on President Biden's decision to withdraw the remaining 2,500 U.S. troops from the country by September 11th and end this country's longest war. Blinken sought to assure senior Afghan politicians that the United States remains committed to the country. We'll maintain the American tradition of providing humanitarian assistance for those most in need, including women, girls, and refugees. I shared that message uh, in all my meetings today with President Ghani, with Chairman Abdullah, with representatives from civil society who are working for change every single day in their communities throughout the country. The United States will remain Afghanistan's steadfast partner. We want the Afghan people, countries in the region, and the international community to know that fact. It's also a very important message for the Taliban to hear. The Taliban has maintained its foothold despite the 20-year-old U.S. military intervention. It's now believed to control more than half the country. A series of corrupt and inept Afghan governments in Kabul have inspired little confidence. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said that even after the pullout, the U.S. military will keep counter terrorism capabilities in the region to keep pressure on what he termed extremist groups operating within Afghanistan. He declined to say where those U.S. forces would be positioned or how many there would be. Sonali Kolhakkar is producer and host of the Rising Up with Sonali program and co-director of the Afghan Women's Mission, which works with the Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan. In fact, General Lloyd Austin even went as far as saying the head of the Pentagon saying that, you know, we can, we're can we basically going to convert this into a drone war like we've done in Africa. And he was, I'm assuming, alluding to Libya, Somalia, and Yemen, where the U.S. has had air wars, has just dropped bombs from unmanned drones for many years, for decades now. And they've done that in Afghanistan too, but they've had a fighting force on the ground. Now that fighting force may be removed, but the drone war may escalate and certainly is continuing. They're openly saying that that will continue. That's the U.S.'s way to keep the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, any of the forces that they claim are a threat to the U.S. to keep them in check. Of course, we know what happens when an unmanned drone drops bombs from far above. Um, Civilians do get killed. And, you know, that is certainly not a way to wrap up a war. So there are also 16,000 civilian contractors approximately on the ground in Afghanistan. These are a combination of mercenaries that are um, providing security to the Afghan government. They're going to lose the security that U.S. troops were providing to them. It remains to be seen how they're going to manage that. Maybe they'll leave, maybe they'll stay. Um, And there are certainly other forces on the ground that are special forces, elite forces that the U.S has tried to not count among its 2,300 uh, official forces on the ground, and we don't know whether those will stay in Afghanistan or not. So there's always caveats to troop withdrawal, um, and, and that's that's among them. Sonali Kahatkar's new weekly edition of her Rising Up with Sonali program airs on KPFA at 3 p.m. on Fridays and on KPFK in Los Angeles. She's author of the book Bleeding Afghanistan, Washington Warlords, and the Propaganda of Silence. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Brooklyn, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at KPFA. Dot org. This is an hour-long newscast, and it airs each night at 6 o'clock. I'm Mark Miracle, and today is the 72nd birthday 
of this radio station and the foundation which runs it and the other Pacifica radio stations, including KPFK in Los Angeles. And we are asking you for a birthday gift to allow us to keep going towards another birthday. If you can make a financial donation in honor of our birthday, in commemoration of it, or just to keep us going, give us a call, please, at 1-800-439-5732 or go online at kpfa.org. For all donors, we will give a gift to you, an audio pack honoring our warriors, including a program for Leonard Peltier, a lecture delivered by Reese Ehrlich on the Iran agenda for today, and a conversation between Maxine Hong Kingston and Gary Gosh on the practice of mindfulness and everyday life. That's for every level of donation at 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. And there you can find other thank you gifts for other levels of contributions. 1-800-439-5732, kpfa.org. The top watchdog for the U.S. Capitol Police Force testified today that the force needs cultural change after the broad failures of the January 6th insurrection. Capitol Police Inspector General Michael Bolton told the House Administration Committee that the Capitol Police needs to improve its intelligence gathering, training, and operational planning, as well as to change how the force views its mission. Christopher Martinez reports. Friday will mark 100 days since the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. On Thursday, a House Committee on Administration heard from the Capitol Police Inspector General Michael Bolton. But first, Committee Chair Zoe Lofgren reminded people of why the attack happened, reading a series of quotes from Republican lawmakers. Fellow Americans beat and bloodied our own police. They stormed the Senate floor. They tried to hunt down the Speaker of the House. They built gallows and chanted about murdering the Vice President. They did this because they had been fed wild falsehoods by the most powerful man on earth because he was angry he'd lost an election. There's no question that President Trump is practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of that day. And that was Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Senator Mitch McConnell. Inspector General Michael Bolton was the sole witness. His department has issued two in a series of monthly reports on the Capitol Police Department's preparation and actions on January 6th, highlighting needs in planning, training, operations, and culture change. In regards to cultural change, we see that department needs to move away from the thought of process of a traditional police department and a move to the posture of a protective agency. A police department is geared to being reactive for the most part, whereas a protective agency is postured in their training and planning to be proactive to prevent events such as January 6. Chair Lofgren noted the Inspector General's report found failings of critical equipment. For example, riot shields shattered upon impact and less lethal munitions stocked in the armory or beyond their expiration date. You also reported that officers experienced supply constraints during the insurrection and as a result, unarmed and unescorted civilian employees were sent to deliver less than lethal munitions to officers, but they were hindered by the crowd and fearing for their safety, they left their vehicle and retreated. And you also found that department riot shields were stationed on a deployment bus away from one of the CDU uh, platoons and that that CDU platoon attempted to get to the bus to distribute the shields, but they couldn't do it because the door was locked. And as a result, this particular CDU platoon was required to respond to the crowd without the protection of their riot shield. Lofgren also asked about reports that the Capitol Police were directed to not use less lethal munitions, such as stingball grenades. She asked whether that could have made a difference. Uh, certainly would have provided the department at a better posture to repel these attackers. 
it would put him in a better position. It would be very difficult to say it would have absolutely turned the tide, but it certainly would have gave them a better chance at doing what uh, they needed to do. One of the key questions has been the lack of intelligence or the failure to act on intelligence about the possibility of violence at the Capitol. Democrat G.K. Butterfield of North Carolina raised that issue. The simple explanation of January 6th is that the Capitol Police leadership failed to sound the alarm that an insurrection was probable. Inspector General Bolton recommends that intelligence at the Capitol Police be raised to the level of a bureau with trained analysts. Butterfield also asked about training. Mr. Bolton, let me get your answer in the record on this. Did training deficiencies contribute to the department's inability to carry out its mission on that fateful day? I believe, yes, training deficiencies put the officers, our brave men and women, in a position not to succeed. Several Republican lawmakers placed blame on the Capitol Police Board, made up of the Senate and House Sergeants-at-Arms and the Capitol Architect. Republicans described them as political appointees who have hindered change. Republican Rodney Davis of Illinois says the politics of the Capitol Police Board is a major problem. I'm afraid, though, that politics, and we all know from reports, optics got in the way. Um, many of these common sense uh, recommendations you put forth that we agree to uh, won't be implemented because they're really truly controlled by the political side of Washington, D.C. Democrat Lofgren pushed back with what she called an aside, noting who appointed the board members. Brett Blanton, uh, the architect uh, who sits on the board, was appointed by President Trump. The sergeant of arms of the Senate uh, at the time was Mike Stenger, appointed by Senator Mitch McConnell. And Paul Irving was originally appointed by Speaker John Boehner and carried over in that position by Speaker Pelosi. So it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, help us to try and make this a political discussion. Inspector General Bolton says his monthly flash reports will continue through the rest of this year. Committee Chair Lofgren expects to reconvene her committee for further hearings in the next few days, perhaps as soon as Friday. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Four Democrats today announced legislation to expand the United States Supreme Court with four more justices, upping the total number of seats to 13. They argue that the rights of people of color, women, and immigrants are at risk because of successful actions by Senate Republicans and former President Donald Trump to stack the court with conservative right-wing justices. Democratic Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts is the main sponsor of the Judiciary Act. We are here today because the United States Supreme Court is broken. It is out of balance uh, and it needs to be fixed. And make no mistake about it, the court is broken because leader Mitch McConnell, his Senate Republican colleagues, and Donald Trump broke it. The Republicans stole two seats on the Supreme Court, and now it is up to us to repair that damage. In 2016, then-Republican Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell broke with precedent and refused to even hold a hearing for former President Barack Obama's pick to fill the Supreme Court seat left vacant when Justice Antonin Scalia died, nearly nine months before the presidential election. Obama nominated former Appeals Court Justice Merrick Garland, who now serves as Biden's Attorney General. McConnell said since it was an election year, the choice should be left up to the next president. But when Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died less than two months before last November's election, McConnell rushed the process to confirm then-President Trump's nominee, Amy Coney Barrett. Altogether, Trump was able to appoint three Supreme Court justices in his four years in office. Gerald Nadler, congressman from New York, argues it's logical to have 13 justices to oversee the corresponding circuits because there are 13 federal appeals court circuits. But some people will say, but the Supreme Court, it's always been nine members. But it hasn't. The Constitution leaves the number of justices up to Congress. 
and Congress has changed that number seven times in the history of the country. Nine justices may have made sense in the 19th century, when there were only nine circuits. Only a few hundred appeals were filed before the court every year. But the logic behind having only nine justices is much weaker today, when there are 13 circuit courts, thousands of cases filed before the court each year. And t some people will say we're packing the court. We're not packing it. We're unpacking it. There's nothing in the Constitution that dictates a particular number of Supreme Court justices. Republican lawmakers, including Mitch McConnell, Tom Cotton, and Lindsey Graham on the Senate side, strongly opposed the bill. In a radio interview, Republican House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy of California claimed the action would go against American values. It's taking over an entire branch of government, the judicial system, and it's packing them. It goes against everything we believe as Americans, everything we believe in our Constitution, the idea of fairness. It goes against what Joe Biden, back in the day when he was senator, would say ever to do. But they only want to do it for power and to continue to have control. While Biden has previously called court packing boneheaded, he recently signed an executive order to create a 36-member bipartisan committee to analyze the merits of Supreme Court reforms, including expanding the court, possibly imposing term limits for its justices, and other possible reforms for the federal judiciary as a whole. Democrats were united in their outrage at McConnell's rushed confirmation of now Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett, but they're not all on board with a move to expand the court. In response to a question by a reporter today, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said she has no plans to bring such legislation to the House floor for a vote. It's not out of the question. It has been done before in the history of our country a long time ago. And the growth of our country, the size of our country, the growth of our challenges in terms of the economy, etc., uh, might necessitate such a thing. Uh, but uh, in answer to your question, I have no plans to bring it to the floor. No. The bill is unlikely to pass because in the House, Democrats can only afford to lose two votes on any party line action. In the Senate, it would require abolishing the filibuster, which moderate Democrats like Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona at this point do not support. The Biden administration is beginning to undo a Trump-era ban on health clinics referring women for abortions. The Trump-era rule approach was branded a gag rule by reproductive rights advocates. Medical associations said it violated the doctor-patient relationship. The Trump policy directive led to Planned Parenthood leaving the federal family planning program. Before exiting the program in 2019, Planned Parenthood and its affiliates served an estimated 40% of the patients who got their medical care through the so-called Title X program, Title X funnels, about $286 million a year in grants to clinics providing medical care mainly to low-income women. The nation's top health officials urged caution as more and more people are getting vaccinated against the coronavirus. They say now's not the time to be lax with mask wearing and social distancing, even as the nation nears 200 million vaccinated people. The testimony before a House committee sparked criticism from Republicans in a shouting match. KPFA's Christina Onestead reports. Tempers flared at a House hearing on ending the coronavirus pandemic. Ohio Representative Republican Jim Jordan went after the nation's top infectious disease specialist, Dr. Anthony Fauci, demanding to know when, after a year of lockdown measures to squash the pandemic, the country could return to normal. What measure, what standard, what objective uh, outcome do we have to reach before, before Americans get their liberty and freedoms back? You know, I, you're indicating liberty and freedom. I look at it as a public health measure to prevent people from dying and going to the hospital. You don't think Americans' liberties have been threatened the last year, Dr. Fauci? They've been assaulted. This will end for sure when we get the level of infection very low. It is now at such a high level 
There's a threat again of major surges. Dr. Fauci, Dr. Fauci, over the last year, Americans' First Amendment rights have been completely attacked. Your right to go to church. Jordan continued to interrupt Fauci, who repeatedly warned the U.S. is on the brink of another coronavirus surge with 64,000 daily infections. From the t- right now, we're at an unacceptably high level. We're at, on a daily basis. It's unacceptably high. What number do we get our liberties back? Tell me the number. But what does it have to expire, be? Sir. You need to respect the chair and oh, shut oh. your mouth. That's Los Angeles Representative Maxine Waters. It's very emotional for me. Uh, As you know, my sister was one who was infected and died uh, from COVID-19. And all that I had to depend on was Dr. Fauci. You literally saved millions of folks who would only listen to your advice based on what was happening with the Trump administration and the president... Uh, of the free world, Mr. Trump, uh, he told us it would just disappear. And then he recommended that we use disinfectant. So we depended on you. Fauci's not alone in his warnings. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Director Rochelle Walensky is also urging people to be cautious and continue mask wearing amidst a nationwide vaccination campaign to end the pandemic. She says they're halting the use of a Johnson & Johnson vaccine and will be transparent as they reassess its efficacy. And she reiterated a statement Walensky made earlier this week that racism is a public health threat. She announced a $2 billion infusion to eradicate health care inequity in communities hit hardest by the pandemic, namely communities of color. CDC will distribute $2.25 billion to address COVID-19 health disparities and advance health equity among populations who are high risk and underserved. The CDC says COVID-19 was responsible for an uptick in deaths last year. At least 75 percent of the deaths were directly tied to coronavirus, but the estimate includes deaths from all causes. While officials say a surge could be looming, the rates of deaths have decreased from just over 900 coronavirus deaths a day in March to just over 700 deaths each day this week. The coronavirus has infected more than 32 million people in the U.S., and it's claimed the lives of more than 560,000. I'm Christina Onestead, reporting for KPFA. And this is the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at (laughs) kpfa.org. I'm Eileen Alfandari inviting you to join us at 7 each weekday morning for Upfront. We bring you breaking news, hard-hitting interviews, debates, and in-depth analysis. From the halls of the state capitol to the far reaches of the globe to the streets of Oakland. On KPFA 94.1 FM, KFCF Fresno 88.1 FM, online at kpfa.org. Join us at 7 a.m. for Upfront. And we have been here 72 years thus far. It's always difficult to predict the future, but I assume we'll be here tomorrow. Unless the creek don't rise, or it does rise. Um, This is our 72nd birthday, and we are celebrating it by asking for your birthday gift in a financial form. And if you can celebrate in that way with us, by giving us some money to continue on our way, we'd appreciate it. You can call us at 1-800-439-5732 and get a person and wish them happy birthday and then make a financial contribution. Or you can do it by electronic mail. You can go to our website at KPFA. Dot org for all contributions, no matter how big or how little, you will have our gift from us to you for our birthday, the KPFA Honoring Our Warriors audio pack. 1-800-439-5732, the number to call. 1-800-439-5732. If you appreciate the news and information, the cultural programming, the music that these Pacifica radio stations bring to you, 
Please help us celebrate that effort and continue to keep making that effort with a financial donation at 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. California opened vaccines to all residents 16 years and older today. Governor Gavin Newsom visited a vaccination site in Union City and marked three milestones towards defeating the coronavirus pandemic. Every Californian is now eligible, regardless of their age, 16 and over, to receive and have access to vaccines. Today marks three milestones of sorts. Uh, Today, not one county in California is in the purple tier. Every single county in the state of California is out of the most restrictive tier. Number two, roughly 50%, half of the population in the state of California that is eligible to receive a vaccine has done so. 49% to be exact by midnight tonight, likely we will pass that threshold, half the population. An estimated 22% of Californians are fully vaccinated. The governor continued to promote, to promote his handling of the pandemic, noting the state has the lowest positivity rate in the nation. It once was an epicenter of the pandemic. He says an estimated 2,300 people are hospitalized with coronavirus in California, but three months ago, that number was 23,000. Ten times as big. But he warns, now's not the time to let up your guard. We are making progress. We're going to defeat this disease. We're going to end this pandemic. There is a bright light at the end of the tunnel, but we still have more work to do. Final words, please be mindful that this disease is not taking the month off or the summer off. This disease has not gone away. The only reason we are enjoying the lowest positivity rate in America is because of all your hard work. It's because of not only those of you that have veiled yourself to life-saving vaccines, but it's also all the other important work that is done every single day with non-pharmaceutical interventions, meaning wearing face coverings. Let's not let down our guard. Let's not take these masks off. Newsom says the biggest mistake states and nations are making is giving up on requiring face coverings. He points to COVID-19 surges in Michigan, France, Germany. California suffered more than 59,000 deaths from COVID-19, more than 3.6 million coronavirus infections. A White House official said today the Biden administration is preparing for the possibility that a booster shot will be needed between 9 to 12 months after people are initially vaccinated against COVID-19. David Kessler, chief science officer for President Joe Biden's COVID-19 response task force, told a congressional committee meeting that while the duration of immunity after vaccination is still being studied, booster vaccines could be needed. Meanwhile, Pfizer's chief executive, Albert Bourla, said people will likely need a third booster dose of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine within 12 months and could need annual shots. That's what CNBC reported today based on Borla's comments from April 1st, which were made public today. Initial data has shown that vaccines from Moderna and partners Pfizer and BioNTech retain most of their effectiveness for at least six months, though for how much longer than that has not yet been determined. Even if that protection lasts far longer than six months, experts have said that rapidly spreading variants of the coronavirus and others that may emerge could lead to the need for regular booster shots similar to annual flu shots. Yesterday, California Governor Newsom traveled to an elementary school in Santa Rosa where he touted the return to classroom instruction and urged all people to prepare to reopen to five-day-a-week instruction in the fall. Every single day, hundreds of schools are reopening. Proof point, San Diego this week. Proof point, San Francisco this week. Proof point, the largest school district in the state of California, second largest in America, Los Angeles, opening hundreds of schools in their communities. 
we can do this and we must do it and we must do it sustainably and we must prepare now for full in-person instruction come this next school year. More than a year after the pandemic forced California's classrooms to close, the largest school districts have begun to reopen, mostly with a hybrid model that includes a mix of in-person and distance learning. Many have not yet brought back middle or high school students. Newsom reiterated that his push to get the state's 6.2 million public school students back in the classrooms was a plea rather than an order. As public school students return to classrooms in New York, the state health department has new guidance for preventing the spread of COVID-19 in New York schools. Andrea Sears has that story. In March, the Centers for Disease Control revised its federal pandemic guidelines for schools. Now New York's Department of Health has clarified how those guidelines should be applied in the state. While the CDC recommends reducing social distancing requirements from 6 feet to 3 feet in classrooms, the new state guidance specifies circumstances when 6 feet of distance should be maintained. And according to Andy Pallotta, president of New York State United Teachers, the new state guidance goes a step further. A mask policy has finally been put into place, a mandatory mask policy in New York State. Because before this, it was merely a guideline. He says the state guidelines also make specific ventilation recommendations and maintain important provisions for cleaning, hygiene, and contact tracing. More than 50,000 students will be back in New York City classrooms later this month. While NYSUT is supportive of the new guidance, Pallotta believes the state could do more to help control outbreaks and identify students and staff who may be infected but asymptomatic. He believes the best way to do that is with a stringent testing requirement. It is not being done in the state as of now and we had done a survey of districts there were 700 districts in new york state only 57 were doing any type of covid testing program he knows the federal government has given the state 250 million dollars for testing in new york city alone and 335 million for testing in other parts of the state palata emphasizes teachers and school staff agree with parents that the best place for students to learn is in the classroom we are all on the same side we just want to make sure that it's the safest possible place for students and for educators to be. For New York News Connection, I'm Andrea Sears. Financier Bernie Madoff, who pleaded guilty to orchestrating a massive Ponzi scheme, has died in prison apparently of natural causes. He was 82. He was serving time at the Federal Medical Center in Butner, North Carolina. Madoff had end-stage renal disease and other chronic medical conditions. A judge had sentenced him to 150 years in prison for his multi-billion dollar Ponzi scheme that wiped out people's fortunes and ruined charities and foundations. He became so hated, he had to wear a bulletproof vest when he went to court. Bernie Madoff, dead at the age of 82. Once again, KPFA is 72. Today's our 72nd birthday. We'd like to make it to 82. We'll settle for 73. If you can give us a birthday gift, please give us a call at 1-800-439-5732. That's 1-800-439-5732. Or go online and make that birthday gift at kpfa.org. That's kpfa.org. Partly cloudy and windy tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the upper 50s. That's around the bay. Further inland, sunny with highs in the low 70s. In the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow, sunny with a high of 80 degrees. And in Los Angeles, partly cloudy with highs in the low 70s. That's it for the news. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Dear KPFA listeners, this is Mitch Cesarich, and I want to let you know, due to the shelter-in-place mandate, KPFA has made changes to our programming schedule to ensure we're doing all we can to protect our staff and keep the station work environment safe. 
To follow the mandate, KPFA programmers will broadcast remotely from home, and we will replay programming in the nighttime hours when our building is closed. We're doing all we can to continue. Dear KPFA listeners, this is Mitch Cesarich, and I want to let you know, due to the shelter-in-place mandate, KPFA has made changes to our programming schedule to ensure we're doing all we can to protect our staff and keep the station work environment safe. To follow the mandate, KPFA programmers will broadcast remotely from home, and we will replay programming in the nighttime hours when our building is closed. We're doing all we can.